Welcome to another episode of the show that focuses on Mother Africa. This week we speak to an incredible African woman, Grasha Michelle is her name. We get your views on the issues and we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. This week on Africa Leadership Dialogues, we feature a woman respected right across the African continent and globally as well, an African power woman. Her name is Grasha Michelle. Grasha Michelle is a renowned international advocate for women and children's rights. She has been a social and political activist for many decades. She currently serves in various capacities in several organizations, among them the Elders, the Africa Progress Panel, and the United Nations Millennium Development Goals Advocates Panel. She has won many awards for her humanitarian activities, such as the Laureate of Africa Prize for Leadership for the Sustainable End of Hunger in 1992, and the Nansen Medal for her contribution to the welfare of refugee children in 1995. She is, of course, the widow of the great, respected and loved, the late Nelson Mandela. She was formerly married to the president of Mozambique, the late Samora Michelle as well. The interview was held in Nairobi during the New Faces, New Voices Forum. New Faces, New Voices is a pan-African advocacy group founded by Grasha Michelle that focuses on expanding the role and influence of women in the financial sector. Let's get straight to her views on the issues. Thank you so much, Grasha, for making time to be with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. We're delighted to host you. Mm -hmm. Africa is, many people say, at a tipping point. So much opportunity, and yet there's still a number of threats, serious threats that face the continent. When you look at leadership in Africa today, are there case studies or initiatives that you would say are helping? And if so, what are they? Maybe I'll phrase... Um my thinking a, a bit differently. Mm -hmm. I think we, as Africans, we have reached a, a stage of positiveness, of self-confidence, of a sense of uh, self-worth. Because uh, after many years where our, our continent was portrayed as, uh, some even called as the lost continent, now we are aware and the world is aware that Africa is a continent of opportunity. And this did not happen by chance. It required work and it required determination of our leaders. They put together uh, mechanisms to protect us from the meltdown of the international financial crisis. While everybody in the world was going down, Africa kept itself stable and our economies ever since have been growing in terms of macroeconomic indicators. I think this is important to celebrate. Now, we have to change the narrative of the GDP and begin to ask ourselves, how many people are still going to bed hungry? And how are we going to fix this? How many uh, children are still out of school? Or if they come out of school, they can't read and write and count properly. And how are we going to fix this? How many women are dying just because they are giving birth 
to a child. I could go on and on right. to say we achieved a positive stage. Now we are challenged by the internal consequences of paying too much attention to macroeconomic issues mm. and now it's time to focus on every individual in every country of ours. So if I want to ask or to respond to your issue of leadership, mm -hmm. for me I think uh, today an African leader should be able to uh, pledge to himself or herself that in the next five years, in the next 10 years, let's say in the next 15 years, no child will come out of school without having the knowledge and the skills which are required for the level that child has accomplished. An African leader should see himself or herself as successful if he can say, during my term, I reduced, I eliminated either preventable diseases because children can be immunized, pregnant women can be immunized. Right. And uh, those kind of tools are very simple. They are available. It's a question of making sure that they reach every child every woman, a leader of my continent would measure himself for the extent he would say, I don't have illiteracy in my country because today everybody can easily learn to read and write and communicate so quickly. I mean, with technology now, you don't have to go through the old system of how to teach everyone to read and write. Using the advantages of technology, this can be turned around quickly. So for me, leadership is to seize the opportunities of the moment, use them to the best ability you have, and change drastically the lives of people and to be able to measure yourself. Mm -hmm. Your measure of success is the quality of life of your people. It's the quality of it's life. The quality of life of your people is the measure of your success. And when I say your people, mm -hmm. I'm not saying of some of your people. Or I mean all. Mm -hmm. If you have 24 million citizens, it is the quality of the 24 million people who compose your population which will measure your success. That's powerful. That's powerful. Let's move from leadership to citizenry for a moment. And a lot of the African citizenry, well, many people are lost in cycles of poverty and trying to get out of poverty. It's changing slowly by slowly, but it, it remains a problem. Some people lose hope. Many people feel powerless and they ask, in my space, what can I do? I want to understand. We look at you today as an eminent person, but who was the young Grasha? And did you ever feel hopeless? What are the characteristics and traits that help people break out of that? I want to say something to Africans, I think they have to stop to treat other Africans as poor. I don't think it's right for us to use the terminology which others are, want us to be identified through that kind of terminology, the poor the poorest of the poor. Mm. I want to say here loud and clear, there's no way you can show so much of disrespect for the dignity of another human being 
is to call him the poor. And now to answer your question. I was born in a humble family. I was brought up by a mother of six. By the time I was born, my mother was already a widow. Three weeks before I was born, my father died. We didn't have much, but we have never been poor. My mother brought us with a very strong sense of dignity. My mother made everything possible for us to have food, and she sent us all to school. And all my siblings, we are not uh, affluent, but uh, we are very comfortable with ourselves. And we have uh, that sense of uh, worth because my mother brought us like that. And my mother is not an exception. Millions of mothers on this continent are bringing up these children, their children, in those principles. It's not right for us to treat them as poor. They do not have much material resources. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. You can say they are disadvantaged. You can say they are challenged in the life they run, but they are not poor. So your question is, people get sometimes hopeless. I think it's, uh, it's time. Every one of us in our countries to question the kind of institutions we have put in place and the methods with which we use to involve and to engage our citizens. The sense of uh, hopelessness, I think it comes when people feel they don't have space to express their views, their aspirations, their dreams. They don't have a voice. They don't have, they have a voice. They don't have but an they opportunity. Don't have, they don't to, have a space yes. where their right. voice can be heard right. and taken into account. Because we can hear somebody, you don't listen. Right. Or you can listen, but then you don't take it into account. The hopelessness comes from that. Those people living in our villages, people living in our slums, and uh, they have uh, many ideas, mm -hmm. creative ideas of how to change the circumstances in which they live. We must question whether do they have really a proper platform? Are they interacting with those who have the responsibility of connecting the grassroots with the national policy and national resources to make sure that they meet here in the middle? Those who are our governments have the responsibility of managing resources which are public resources. We, the people who are in slums, who are in villages, who are in townships, we are entitled to these resources. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is how the two meet, listen to one another, and take into account the aspirations of one another. Sometimes, you can have very good policy and you can have very good legislation. You can have very good structures. But ask how many millions of citizens are aware of those policies? Mm -hmm. How many millions of our citizens get assets to where the resources are really being, you know, made 
available. Mm. And even in terms of knowledge. I mean, our societies have evolved in knowledge. But uh, how that knowledge tap into the knowledge and wisdom of grassroots, of people at our village, then to build and to effect a change. I think we have a very serious problem of communication. And that needs to be addressed. It has to be addressed. So mm -hmm. we say, oh, people are hopeless. It's easy for us to say they are hopeless. No, I think we should question what is missing mm -hmm. for us to be able to listen and give expression to aspirations of those people. So the, the problem is not with the people. It's the, pe the problem is those, with those who are expected to govern, and I'm not saying to rule, mm. yeah. They are expected to govern in different levels in which the main, if I can say even, the exclusive responsibility is service and to act as a service. We, we, we don't have to, 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 to say how much we have done. I don't think it's, it's, it's the issue. The important thing is uh, what is the impact of what of we what have done? done and what is the change which our hard work has effected? Because you can work very hard you can be very dedicated, and have but if impact. you have not made the desired impact, mm. and if you have not effected change, then thank you very much. So it's not enough. It's not good enough. And so measurables are key. Exactly. Now I want to come to one thing. Yes. Which also, I think at my age I'm allowed to say, <laughs> is that we are very good in saying, oh, we made a lot of progress. And I want to say a lot of progress, it says everything and it says nothing at the same time. African have to begin to talk with measurable progress. And you say, in 2015, let me again give an example. If you measure the quality of, of life of people and you say, in 2015, I had one million people who were going hungry. But in 2020, none of those people is going hungry. Right. Now we know that the measure of success, it's one, pe one million people who moved from being hungry and now they have food. Then in 2020, you will say, yeah, they have food. But what is the quality of food they right. have? Right. So from two, 2020 to 2025, you will measure that these million people or the totality of my people, not only they have food, but they have quality food. And now I'll come to one point, mm -hmm. for instance. In children, if you say today, Africa has 43% of children who are standard. Each country has a different percentage. This is the average on the continent. I do not know what is the average in, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But we should be able to say today, this is the percentage of stunted children. In five years, what is the percentage which has... Uh, uh, what is the change? What is exactly. The change? And in five, 10, 15... So we need to quantify that progress. This issue of saying we are doing much, we are doing better, it says everything and nothing at the same time. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues.
The message is stop the generalizations, let's measure, let's ensure we are moving, how far are we moving, are we doing the right things, are we it's putting okay. our efforts into the right, our energies in the right place. Grash, I want to come to the fact that some countries have found stability, in some countries uh, governance is improving, in other spaces there are new conflicts. Um, looking at Boko Haram in Nigeria, looking at the Al-Shabaab situation in Eastern Africa, and the question of how Africa can support African states, especially when it comes to conflict. We've seen really painful things happening in, in Central Africa, and it seems other African states often watch, and I, I dare I use the word again, hopelessly, as if we can't do anything. W what is the answer? If I am well informed, uh, it looks like it's not necessarily that uh, African heads of states are doing nothing. They are doing little and too slow. That's my view. It has been decided long time ago that the African Union should have those um, structures at sub-region level, so that they can respond quickly, timely, when an emergency comes. Ask how much of those structures are in place. If they were in place, mm. and they had been equipped properly, wherever a challenge emerges, those units would move quickly on behalf of the rest of the continent. They would move quickly to support the country which is directly challenged. But I don't think these structures, um, although they have been decided a long time ago, that they are operational. Let me give you the example of Ebola. Ebola found us unprepared. Ask yourself how long it took for the ministers of health to meet and then to go to the heads of states to make a commitment. And from commitment then to mobilize uh, human resources to send to those countries which are affected. And then they discovered that, yes, countries are offering 1,500 health workers, but no one was prepared to pay for these health workers to move into Liberia, Sierra Leone, and you, you know what I mean? So when I say it's not that they are not acting, they act too slow right. and too little for the magnitude of the problem. And this has to change. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but it has to change. You know why? Because the reality is that we are sending, Africans are sending a message that African lives That's don't important. count. Right. They don't count. You, 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 you see, we get used, we, we, we become used to thousands dying. And in the case of Boko Haram, it's thousands who have been abducted. And it happens again and again. But look what happens if it's other part of the world. Right. It's not in numbers, anything comparable to our thousands, but they all move immediately. They take steps because they know one single life of their citizens, matters. you know, matters. Ours are too cheap. And actually, it's not even cheap. They don't count. Gosh, let me ask this. And, and you, have, you have a knowledge and an understanding of, of our leadership in terms of the fact that you've done work with the APRM. You do a lot of work on the continent. Having engaged with, with African leaders, is it that it doesn't matter? Are they scared of coming down too harsh and being accused of being despots? Or is it that they're not aware of what they need to do? We don't have enough military expertise. Uh, if you were asked, I would be, I would be, I would be very pretentious if I was to say why. I think what we as citizens should do is precisely to ask them 
Why? Why? <laughs> because I have never been a head of state. Thank God. <laughs> because I wouldn't take that responsibility. But we have the right as a citizens to ask them. Mm -hmm. Because this, uh, today we are talking about Ebola. But uh, yesterday we were talking about other problems. But it, we don't seem to feel that there's a sense of urgency. We don't seem to, f we don't feel that there is really a huge, a huge preoccupation of understanding that the first and the most important responsibility of any government is to protect its citizens, to protect the integrity, mm. the physical integrity of their citizens. And of course, then it's food, it's water, it's that. But it's to keep citizens safe. It's 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 a very it's a very difficult. So I, I don't want to say why it's not happening. I would say I would ask if I would have an opportunity. But you know the other thing which we have, you and I, as citizens, we have to go through a very elaborate uh, system of institutions if you are to table a question <laughs> to our heads of states mm -hmm. at African Union. It, it varies from country to country, it's different. There are heads of states who are very approachable and they are open to, to, to receive and uh, to talk to their citizens. But if you are talking the continent and you say the machinery of mm. African Union, oh no, I'm sorry. You have to go through a very elaborate and very complicated, and in most of times, you don't even have a space in which you can address heads of states. They are, they, 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 you, you can have someone to speak on your behalf, but even if you are an organized civil society, you can't have a platform to address them. So that, that's, that's a bit of a complication for me. Okay, it so is a bit of complication so for So to the African Union, too much bureaucracy. Some of these questions need to be answered to all heads of state and, and government watching. The question is, does it matter? Does, do African lives matter? Do your citizens' lives matter? And if they do, why is there not a sense of urgency? We, we if, even if they, 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 my heads of states, they can say I'm being too harsh if I say African lives do not matter. They may think that I'm being too harsh. What I want to give is an example. Any one of us who is a parent or a grandmother like me, if my granddaughter is at risk, I tell you, mm. I will not sleep before I have made sure that right. my granddaughter is safe. The sense of urgency and of doing everything possible. possible. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Right. That's what I'm talking about. And if you care, when it hits home, yes, yes. when it hits home, every one of us will move mountains to make our children our grandchildren safe. But when it is the people in our country, then the, the, the speed and the, 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 the energy and the effort which we put, it's much, much, much slower. And it's precisely because of that. In that process, it's hundreds and it's thousands of Africans who go. It's that sense of urgency first and the sense of moving everything possible to prevent it from happening. And if it happens once, mm. you vow that it's not going no, to gonna happen, happen second. Again. If my granddaughter, if I lose a granddaughter, I will do everything possible. I'm not going to lose another one. And that's the difference. When that's you the care. difference when you care deeply yes. and when it hits home. Right. And that's what I'm, I'm saying.
When you care, you move mountains. I, our time is already up. Would you believe it? I feel like I've been in a leadership lecture. It's, it's, I, I've taken so much wisdom from this discussion today, and I, I hope you have as well at home. But before we close, you're here because of uh, several initiatives, but new faces, new voices, an amazing initiative that's making so much change and trying to encourage inclusiveness, in particular, particularly empowering women. Um, I want you to speak to women and also young people in Africa directly. Um, we have a youth bulge. We have a lot of young people with so much energy. I believe the youth are the greatest uh, opportunity for the continent. Um, our women are such hard-working people. They do incredible things in the countries across Africa. What's your message, though, to the youth and to women in Africa? How can we continue to be a force for transformation wherever we might be in whatever space? To women in particular, I have to say I deeply appreciate the dedication and the capacity and determination of uh, women to uh, care for the families, their communities, and even in a public space to effect change. My assessment is that we need to be much more organized mm -hmm. because the movement, uh, women's movement, is fragmented and while it is fragmented it's not going to be strategic in its thinking in making priorities right and being able to address and engage decision-making institutions in an effective way that's why we created the new faces new voices it's not because there are no women out there who are doing wonderful things. We are saying we need to be much more organized. We have to build a movement. We need to strategize. We need to define priorities. And we have to have the right messages which will change structures. Not only change by change, structures. Mm -hmm. Which then, when those structures have been changed, they will open the avenue for millions, millions more women than to walk uh, through the economic empowerment. That's New Faces, uh, uh, New Faces is, 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 is all about. To young people, I may sound um, a bit uh, harsh on them. I want to say that today millions of our young people have benefited from education. And sometimes they dismiss that because they say, well, so what? I have education, but I don't have a, a job. Mm. Celebrate the fact that governments have provided education to millions of young people. Now, what is needed is together with government, but particularly young people themselves, they're so creative. They, they have brilliant ideas. They are very, very unconventional, if you like, even. Use that. Take initiative. Think it through and say, what can I do for myself to change my status? Mm. And you take initiative. Once you take initiative, it's because you have chosen exactly what. The ability of choosing, it's something which some of us didn't have those days. But to choose what you want to do, to take initiative, to knock at the doors which can enhance your initiative, whether individually, whether with a group of you, but opportunities have to be grasped. Opportunities are not offered. They are opened, and then every single one of young people have to grasp those opportunities. And in some countries, they are already I mean, funds which have been established for young people, for them to have to start a business. Mm -hmm. Don't expect to be employed. Employ yourself. And you don't know how to start. There are institutions which can help you to do the ABC of mm -hmm. starting a business. Mm -hmm. Look for those institutions. Ask for help. You will reduce the number of people, of young people who will be complaining. If we take initiative, we act, we ask support, 
we ask for mentorship, but we move and to, to take control of our life and not only expecting whether it will be just the government or it will be just the private sector to employ you. There will never be enough jobs for all the millions of young people we have, particularly this time of our lives right. where a majority of our population are young. So take initiative, start your own business, ask someone to help you, but it reduce the number of people who sit and complain. Take initiative. Maybe you'll be hiring other young people soon. Absolutely. Russia. It's so humbling. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you on the show. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Grassa Michelle. I was supposed to have had a dialogue on Africa in leadership and dialogue. I had a conversation with Julie in which I expressed myself, but definitely it was not necessarily about leadership. What an educational talk that was. I hope you learned as much as I did from it. Let's get to your views on the issues. This week, we asked you, how can the citizenry ensure accountability on the part of politicians? Robert Kiryanki says, what gets measured gets done. By having measurable scores for our elect leaders, we will ensure accountability. My name is Dennis Mukundi and I'm watching Africa Leadership Dialogue from Nairobi County. Citizens can ensure that politicians are accountable by holding robust public meetings which um, encourage them to talk about the civil issues that matter to them and as well as enable them to put the politicians to be responsible and respond to what they raised in the meetings. Thank you. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. And it's time now for Africa's Top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature African countries with public trust in politicians. The study focused on how the citizens rate the ethical standards of politicians. It is ranked out of a possible seven. This is according to the World Economic Forum. Starting us off at number 10 is Namibia with an index of 3.2 and is ranked at number 59 globally. Coming in at number 9 is Ghana. The Republic is ranked at number 55 globally with an index of 3.29. Positioned at number 8 is Swaziland. The South African state attained an index of 3.3 and is ranked at number 54. Taking the number 7 spot is Morocco. The North African country is ranked at number 53 globally with an index of 3.35. At number 6 is Lesotho with an index of 3.45 and is ranked 47 globally. Slotted in at number 5 is Seychelles. The island country attained an index of 3.49 and is ranked at number 45 globally. Cap Verde takes the number 4 spot with an index of 3.63 and is ranked at number 40 globally. Taking the number 3 spot is Botswana. Hailed as one of the biggest diamond producers, Botswana is ranked at number 39 globally with an index of 3.66. Coming in at number 2 is The Gambia. The West African country attained an index of 3.8 and is ranked at number 32 globally. And at number 1 this week is Rwanda. With the fastest growing economy in Africa, Rwanda is ranked at number 10 globally with an index of 5.3. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. As always, we end with wise words, an African proverb for you. Here we go. It's the young trees that make up the forest. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.